Okay, guys, I believe we are live today. We are here with your host, myself, Killian Carter, for quarantine. I'm, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Although Tory Lanez is is having his uh, quarantine radio right now. Go check that out if you're interested in some debauchery. But no, nah, I'm Killian Carter, and I'm here, your host of The Questionable Perspective. And today we have the autopsy of one Bernard Sanders. What went right and what went wrong with Bernie Sanders' campaign? What can future campaigns learn from this campaign? And, well, we might as well get started here. So I'm going to pull up, give me one moment here, guys. I'm going to pull up a political article um, here. Here we go, guys. Uh, Political article. No, this is a must-read article. I've highlighted some key portions, but I suggest reading it in full. Um, It's really a remarkable piece of of sadness, in my opinion, as a Bernie supporter. But anyway, title is, No one went for a knockout blow inside Bernie's campaign nosedive. Okay, so I'm going to go through this article and the highlighted parts, I'm going to comment, I'm going to give commentary to what that means and I think what we need to do in the future and what Bernie Sanders needed to do um, with some hindsight, honestly with some foresight, but um, let's, nonetheless, let's get a little, let's get into it. Okay, so um, moderate Democrats were terrified Sanders could win the nomination and the target on his back was bigger than ever before. Now, this is something that needs to be grappled with. So when we look at Bernie Sanders' campaign, we have to understand that this was a stacked deck. We knew that the Democratic establishment did not want Bernie Sanders to be the nominee because he threatened their established power, and they were willing to nominate somebody as senile and um, kaput as as, uh, Joe Biden. So so that's, that's... something that needs to be kept in mind. And when keeping that in mind, it's also to note that Bernie Sanders should have known that he was running in a race, that he knew that the deck was stacked against him, so he should have acted accordingly. So, um, they're talking about um, Bernie Sanders' debate performances coming into Nevada and South Carolina. And right here I highlighted and mostly stuck to his talking points. So I highlighted this because this was one of the key things as somebody who watched every I watched every um, debate DNC debate this year and and one thing that I always thought while watching Sanders was that he needed to be more aggressive we'll get to that later but he needed to be more aggressive and he needed to have his arguments more pointed they needed to be more precise and concise they needed to hit differently because routinely when Sanders would be giving these debate things, it was a benefit in some times that he could always go back to his stump speech. But in certain point, points, I think he missed a lot of opportunities to land damaging blows on other opponents because of the unwillingness to break away from his talking points or to be able to do his talking points more fluidly. He would talk about, he would bring up multiple points and he would usually circle around the, the same four or so talking points related to one topic, and I think a lot of the times he needed to adjust his um, framing of things and frame things depending on the person he was talking to. So I think going forward, I think one thing that needs to be addressed is that, well, Bernie Sanders is not a bad debater. He's not an exceptional debater, and it was lucky that his policy was just so extraordinary that he could um, debate that the way he did. But I think going forward, we need to understand that – if we're going to be doing this, we need to hone. I'm not talking about being a politician and lying about your talking points, and I don't want you fabricating or embellishing what your talking points are. But I need you to know your. I need you to have your Apple research done, and we'll get to that later. Your Apple research needs to be done, and you need to be able to um, message it clearly to the public. So, <clears throat> knocking out uh, Biden was job number one, and even when he was down, no one went for the knockout blow, and that was a problem. So. I so let me let me lay out the the key things that I believe are wrong with the Sanders campaign. So uh, or went wrong with the Sanders campaign. I believe, and I'm going to try to hit on all these topics throughout the video. Um, so the two things that this article really discusses, and that I believe are the biggest factors um, into Bernie Sanders losing, was like I mentioned, a stacked deck, and that is at the end of this article. But essentially, the 
entirety of the Democratic establishment and the media um, apparatus lined up to stop Sanders. This was mixed by... <coughs> excuse me, guys. I'm, it's allergy season here. But um, anyway, this was mixed by Sanders, who, like I said, should have known that he was walking into a stacked deck, not fully understanding that he needed to be aggressive, that none of these people were his friends, as he liked to call them. These people were down to stop Bernie Sanders at any cost. They were having secret meetings. Um, people to judge and uh, other staffers, Pelosi and Schumer, Clinton and Warren, all these people are having meetings. <coughs> My apologies. All these people are having meetings and um, to stop Bernie Sanders. So she have, he should have known this and ran the race like that because Bernie Sanders ran a very anti-establishment candidacy with a lot of anti-establishment rhetoric, talking about calling out the billionaires, calling out the corruption, calling out um, the for-profit industries that are um, killing people and um, making their money out the backs of working people. But, um, and, and Bernie Sanders was, and he would talk in revolutionary rhetoric, but when it came down to acting upon it, when allowing his circuits to attack people, when it came to being on national news circuits, when it came to being on the debate stage, Sanders was a little bit more cautious with the way he dealt with them when the people that he was dealing with they not only had the gloves off, they had brought in a knife to the fight. This was a boxing match that turned into a prison yard brawl, and they brought Shanks, and Bernie Sanders was still still had his gloves on for whatever reason, um, due to his I ideology potentially and his unwillingness to run a negative campaign. So, <clears throat> evidence of this is, according to interviews with more than 20 Sanders aides, surrogates, and top allies, many believe that he should have been more aggressive in talking and taking on Biden, including over the idea that he was more electable in November. They also complained about the campaign's organized strategy and the inability to win over black and senior voters. Though nearly everyone in Sanders' circle felt that media and political establishment played critical roles in taking him down, they think the nomination was in reach. See, that's what hurts so bad about this campaign, is Bernie Sanders effectively won the first three states, um, and something that has never really been done before and would guarantee a victory almost inevitably with any other candidate that wasn't um, going against the entire establishment apparatus. So what Bernie Sanders um, did was he... So, so the media had kind of propped up Joe Biden's electability since the beginning of this campaign, stretching all the way back to March um, of 2019. And this kind of led to the ability and the perception that Joe Biden was electable, as well as the media hammering over and over again against Bernie Sanders, even though contrary evidence, even though the polling showed that he was um, the second best person electability-wise to defeat uh, Donald Trump. And when you looked at other factors to be factored in besides just pure polling that is um, malleable based on how the media perception is going, um, Joe or Bernie Sanders had a lot less weaknesses than Joe Biden, and he never pointed these out. These weaknesses include trying to cut Social Security, trying uh, voting for the Iraq War, the crime bill, um, drone bombing people, um, increasing the amount of people that were deported under Obama, um, so on and so forth. And so they talk about... So Bernie Sanders, one thing that I really think is undervalued, and I haven't really heard anybody else talk about it, so I think this is a novel idea, and or a novel um, thing that I think needs to be kind of like looked at was I don't know the exact spending. I know that Bernie was probably spending I think second most in court, second most to Bloomberg and Steyer when it came to even television ads. But a lot of Bernie's game was based on ground gain and voter to voter outreach. But like like I'm kind of getting to we'll get to later in the article. There was just so much media propaganda um, being perpetrated against the Sanders campaign that um, he needed to do something to kind of counter this. And later on in this um, article, it'll talk about that a little bit, about how his people th thought that he needed to go in, get more people onto MSNBC to argue for him. But what I would argue is actually, these people are going to be so hostile to you and give such twisted narratives anyway, that what Bernie Sanders should have done to win over older voters and seniors that are not online, black voters that... Um, older black voters that are typically not online is he needed to do a lot. He needed to spend a lot more money on television ads. 
he needed to do targeted television ads. And I think that if he would have done targeted television ads, and I need aggressive television ads. They need to be television ads and they need to be aggressive. This needs to be, and, and this is kind of, I'm going to get to one of the, the main points of how I think Bernie Sanders should have done this. This campaign should have been predicated on comparing um, Joe Biden to Hillary Clinton because Hillary Clinton lost and the entire electability argument is based on the uh, the idea that he's moderate and these sa safe candidates are the ones who are going to win when if you look at the um history of the democratic candidates um al gore john Kerry, and hillary clinton they've all lost as running like moderates the only person that was able to want win was obama who ran a faux po uh, a faux progressive um uh candidacy and he's the only one that was able to do it because people were looking for hope and change obviously obama didn't bring it the way that he um espoused on the campaign trail but that's the way you win a campaign and bernie sanders never made this link to joe biden and hillary clinton i think that was a fatal mistake and i think if if he was if he was doing it right he should have been connecting joe biden and hillary clinton and things that hillary clinton has said and things that joe biden have said that have um been um comparable and done like creepy music like dun 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 and all these other type of you know just some good um cinematics and um choreography and whatever else that you put into a video to kind of shed light on joe biden and when it comes to black voters the fact that bernie sanders never attacked joe biden on his um on his record with black voters uh um, the fact that he had lied and there was little videos from the eighties admitting that he lied, like it was a scandal. And that's why he lost his second, uh, presidential bid back in the eighties is because he lied about being a civil rights activist. And yet he continued this campaign to lie. And that kind of comes back. And this is just so much, it's all interconnected and it's so interwoven because it, not only was it Bernie Sanders job, um, first and foremost, but it was, well, it, just as much the job of the media to call out this yet the media never questioned joe biden's credentials they let him just slide and why is that because the mainstream media is nothing more than the propaganda arm the cnn's and the msc's msnbc's are the propaganda arms of um of the of the democratic party well as fox news is the propaganda arm of the republican party do not get it twisted they like to pretend as if though they are morally superior to fox news yet they set narratives they do it more subtly as is common within neoliberal spheres is to do things in an underhanded way instead of being so uh uh, uh kind of averse and uh kind of so so bold like fox news is they do it subtly where they just control what the narrative is control this control that and Bernie Sanders needed a little bit more fight when he got in there. He needed to go and he needed to tell these people that Joe Biden was lying about his record with, with black people and he was and you needed to point out things and you needed to put aggressive videos comparing and I know that comparing the field to Joe or to, to Hillary Clinton. In fact, he needed to link, if he was really savvy, he would have linked the entire Democratic establishment, basically essentially everybody except him running and linked them to the establishment and made the establishment out to be John Kerry, Al Gore, and um and, and Hillary Clinton. So then he could have lumped in Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar, and all of them and gotten them all in a fine swoop and then particularly honed in on Biden as being particularly similar to Hillary Clinton when you look at their voting records and um, their political careers in general. So so what I'm saying here is what I'm trying to get to is essentially Joe Biden is Joe Biden was so susceptible to attacks and they needed to go and do many TV ads to try to win over older voters that are not going to be watching um, mainstream media and um, stuff like that. Um, so I think that was a critical mistake and I think it's something that really hasn't been talked about as much is the fact, yes, he needed to be aggressive and yes, he needed to do more ads, but in he, need he needed to do a lot more ads, I think, to kind of reach that demographic, like I'm saying, to kind of um, get over the media bias that is so present. Um, he says it turned into a superficial media perception of safe, electable Biden versus revolutionary Bernie Sanders. And I think that dynamic kind of hurt. So kind of speaking on this and kind of basing on everything else that I've been talking about is the fact that Bernie Sanders needed to, and I think it's been brought up on the, on the Hill rising is that Bernie Sanders too often compared himself to, um, countries like Denmark and countries like, um, Sweden and all that. Like, well, 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 we agree. We, we love their policies and, and we think they're great places and, 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 and good places to live. What Bernie needed to do was compare his 
compare what he was doing and to while he was um, vilifying the establishment as being Hillary Clinton, he needed to prop himself up as FDR. He needed to have videos with like soaring American music and FDR and just, just relating Bernie to FDR because that would stoke it, would stoke Bernie's campaign in um, the American tradition, as um, they say on Rising, and I think that's a very, I think that's a very important distinction. Is that going forward in future races, we need to handle this with understanding that a lot of people don't hate America, maybe as much as other people do, and this and that, and maybe they shouldn't, but should or shouldn't, and that and that's perception. But one thing is, is that FDR is a beloved figure, um, is obviously talked about as one of the greatest presidents. Um, that we've ever had, and I think that Bernie really lacked in that he would mention that it was like FDR, but he never took it to the level I'm saying. He needed to do more TV ads, he needed to have more language, and he needed to, and when they say revolutionary language, yes, Bernie was, in a sense, kind of revolutionary just based on the status quo, but based on the rest of the world, based on those other countries I was talking about, Bernie is nothing but the center, and compared to FDR, he's also a center candidate. He's an FDR Democrat, so I think it comes down to pointing out that these other people are um, similar to Hillary Clinton, similar to these John Kerry, similar to these Al Gores, and that Bernie Sanders is similar to FDR. And I think the fact that he did not point this out, and this kind of comes back to what I was saying about his inability to be concise and to be flexible with his arguments in um, debates, is he needed to make these adjustments and he needed to make these things more pointedly. Okay, so a few top Sanders advised felt that Bernie would be seen as more eligible once he won early states and that the matter would take care of itself, while others argued that the campaign should have directly made the case. One option that worked well at the doorsteps was arguing that when, so basically this is what I was talking about, that Democrats nominated safe establishment choices such as Hillary Clinton and John Kerry they lost, and that Biden was the latest in a long line of mainstream nominees whose appearance as sure winners was a mirage, but instead the candidate typically used his go-to lines in the subject that he defeated Trump in nearly every poll, and winning in November would require unprecedented turnout and excitement, which failed to stick. So, once again, I agree with everything in that in that part. Like I would say, I would also say that while we need to continue doing the door knocking because face-to-face -face content is so vital, we also need to be doing... Um, we also need to be doing a lot of television ads if we're trying to win presidential elections like that because of the older de demographic skew and the fact that young voters are fickle to get out. So we need to remember that our resources also need to be pooled toward um, television ads because that's what they're going to be seeing and that will help counter mainstream media narratives. And um, this this part up here at the top actually a few about him thinking that it would just take care of itself. So. What I talked about earlier with Bernie Sanders kind of knowing the field that he was going to be getting himself into is, here's the thing, is that Bernie Sanders, and this is what they kind of, I've heard different advisors admit, Chuck Rocha, I think Faz Secur, um, a bunch of people, is that Bernie Sanders' strategy was like what people would consider to be winning before Super Tuesday because he was consolidating his block well. It was, this field was getting split by all the centrists. But the thing was is that we knew the deck was stacked. And if you know the deck is stacked, then you know that you have to overwin. Because while it may not be fair on a, com on a completely, if you looked at this from like a completely like barren aspect, Bernie Sanders essentially got cheated. And even like the first amount of blame goes to the establishment for setting up a rigged process. But now that you know that, now that you've decided to run in a rigged process, you need to understand the parameters of what you're going to need to do to win. And to do this, you need to not be content with just barely winning by 5%, 35% to 28% or whatever the margins you're winning and that Nevada win was crushing of 48 to 20, I believe, next to Biden. And that was a very good win. But, but remember, we need to overwin. We need to, and that was the thing is that when Bernie Sanders started to win, it seemed like he was coasting and he even kind of relaxed even more on Biden and was not even attacking Biden as much as he should have been. And that's what they're saying is, Sanders never went for that knockout blow when he was injured. You needed to finish the establishment. You needed to have piercing ads, piercing rhetoric that called out their bullshit and told and told them what was what. And Bernie Sanders got too comfortable with coasting. And I think that was a big problem was was not having that like kind of killer instinct, that Mamba mentality. Shout out to Kobe. Um, and I think uh, 
And I think that really hurt Bernie Sanders was not having just a just a killer instinct, not having that that urge to want to dominate the field. We if we're up by a few points, it doesn't matter. We want to be up by more points. We want to increase our league. We want to make this a showing. This is this is an exhibition of our might. And Bernie Sanders got too comfortable with coasting, and I think that really hurt him. Um, this is just a little thing I wanted to highlight. Um, this is more speculation, a little bit more controversial, but Bernie Sanders has expected more time in South Carolina where African Americans cast more than half of the vote in Democratic primaries in the weeks before the primary there. But the senator had to scale those plans back to the impeachment proceedings, said people familiar with the schedule. Some Sanders advisors and allies felt that especially hurt him because he tended to do better with voters who saw him up close. And I think this really hurt him. And I've heard, um, theories that... Nancy Pelosi hold the, held the impeachment articles um, intentionally to kind of hurt Bernie Sanders to get him off the campaign trail. Obviously, I can't speak to that. And obviously, that's not really a substantiated claim. But I think it is really something interesting to think about with how um, vigorous the establishment was trying to stop Bernie Sanders. So I'm going to keep going. Um, okay. And this is just – I'm sick and tired of talking about Warren. But they brought it up because it obviously had to be brought up. So – um, he talked to Warren on the phone multiple times after she dropped out to Super Tuesday. A top aide said he asked for endorsement as well as for a nod from Andrew Yang and Tom Steyer, the staffer said. Um, but not none of them threw their weight around him, essentially, is what it gets to. And I think this is really telling for both Warren and Yang. So Steyer was a wild card. It is what it is. I'm, I'm not really worried about Steyer because he's not a... I don't think... I mean, he might run again, but... I mean, we'll remember it. But essentially, Warren spited the left... Why would Warren, who ran her entire campaign, tr basically trying to be the safer version of Bernie Sanders, who was younger, basically copying all of his party platform or all of his policy platforms when he already had a movement on his back and was sapping votes from him? Why did Elizabeth Warren ask yourself that? Why did Elizabeth Warren stay in until Super Tuesday, where she ended up not even winning a state, which everybody basically predicted before? Um, before Super Tuesday had even occurred. Why was Elizabeth Warren in this race? People keep saying that Elizabeth Warren is a friend of the left. I com consider that to be completely bogus. She's a phony, and she is a part of the Democratic establishment. She stayed into the primary to injure Sanders, because if Elizabeth Warren drops out on Super Tuesday, Sanders wins Maine for sure, Minnesota for sure, has the potential to win Texas, and, and, and multiple, and, um... I, he would even have closer margins in other states, would, which would help the delegate total. So I think that's something to really consider. And the fact that he asked for her endorsement and she wouldn't give it to him just shows the level of spite she has for the left and the working class over something as simple as emojis. If you're a true fighter for the people, you do not back down over emojis. Let's be honest. And to Andrew Yang, who ran this anti-establishment campaign, who then got a CNN job and then... And after endorsed Joe Biden, admitted that he was thought he was going to get a cabinet position, um, should be ashamed of himself and is nothing but a shill. I'm sorry, Andrew Yang fans that are watching this, but Andrew Yang is a phony. I will, I like Andrew Yang's UBI, and I think it should be implemented. And I think there should be different UBIs looked at because I don't think Andrew Yang's was the best UBI possible. But I do appreciate that he got that into the topic, especially now with the coronavirus crisis and this becoming even more of a talking point uh, kind of in the uh, discussion. But beyond the fact of entering that into the discussion, Andrew Yang is a phony and a sellout and somebody who is willing to put uh, his own uh, movement upward in a system at the expense of other voters or at the expense of the um, working class. So let's see. And then it says he was deeply disappointed that she didn't endorse afterwards said a person familiar with the talks with Warren. It made him question her progressivism. And I think that is just so relevant is that Bernie Sanders is just such a good natured guy. And that's why I'm saying the rigidity of his ideology hurt him. The fact that he was not going to attack people and he just expected, I don't know why, because he knew that the establishment hated him and he would even talk about it um, in his campaign rallies and he would talk about it yet. He pretended as if though they wouldn't gang up against them. Elizabeth Warren who failed to back Sanders in 2016 had, a, had meetings with Hillary Clinton and so on and so forth. Um, and then speaks praise on Joe Biden, even though she, Joe Biden was allegedly the, per, the reason she got into politics because of the bankruptcy bill. Then she has flatter, more flattering words for Joe Biden than Bernie Sanders. Think about that. Why would that be? Because San Elizabeth Warren was nothing more than a, than the sword, the final dagger in Sanders' back to finish him during Super Tuesday.
So, I had a meeting with top aides a few months before the Iowa caucus. Senior advisor Chuck Rosa raised concerns about the fact that they lacked precinct captains for hundreds of caucus sites in the state. I think that just kind of points out that I don't think this was the main reason. I think it would have helped to clearly win Iowa so that there wasn't as much drama. But, yeah, just making sure to have precinct captains because you know the establishment is going to try to rig it or try to get these towing costs to go in their way that are not as um, that are, that are not as uh, transparent and and honest as they could be. So in the future, I think we need to have our precinct captains and other organizations on election day under control. So I've talked a lot about Bernie Sanders and his inability to be aggressive, his inability to get past his rigidity of his of ideology and his um, inability to um, do what was necessary uh, to win. But so, in a sense, in a lot of ways, I blame Bernie. And actually, before I get to this point, let me show you a video of the way Trump handled his handled the RNC and other people in um, twenty in the 2015-2016 election cycle. Let me talk quiet. Now, a lot of times, a lot of times, <coughs> that's all of his donors and special interests out there. <laughs> so, that's what it is. That's what, and by the way, let me just tell you, we needed tickets, you can't get them. You know who has the tickets for the, I'm talking about to the television audience? Donors, special interests, the people that are putting up the money. So it is. The RNC told us we have all donors in the audience. And the reason they're not loving me, the reason they're not, excuse me, the reason they're not loving me is I don't want their money. I'm going to do the right thing for the American public. I don't want their money. I don't need their money. And I'm the only one up here that can say that. From let, me talk, let me talk. Quiet. And that aggressive right there, just the call, telling Joe Jeb Bush to be quiet, just that 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 just viciousness that Trump has, that just no no fucks given attitude that Trump presents is something that Bernie could have just taken strides, could have taken pointers from, and even Obama, who was actually more aggressive towards Hillary Clinton in the 2008 primary than Bernie was to Hillary or Biden in either of these last two um, election cycles, Bernie Sanders needed to be pointed he needed to be aggressive and i think the next leader needs to have a little bit of trump in them to be honest and when, when i say that i don't mean the lying and all that i want you to be honest but i need you to be i need you to be fearless i need you to be confident i need you to be braggadocious and i want need you to understand that you are the one carrying the mantle and this is something that bernie lacked and i really really think that hurt him so um let me see let me get back to this so we're going to look at the media bias. So many in the campaign partly game cable media TV for that. Media tracking service critical mention estimating that Biden enjoyed nearly 72 million in almost completely positive earned media in the days between South Carolina and Super Tuesday. But some of Sanders' aides also think they should have done a better job handling the press. They think the campaign should have had more cigarettes on MSNBC and other channels. Staffers were also told at time not to pitch opposition research, a standard for communication uh, shop on most campaigns due to the fact that Sanders disliked negative campaigning. So this is just unbelievable because Bernie Sanders, the entire campaign, first they ignored him in the summer and the times leading up as if they just ignored him, Bernie Sanders would go away. Then they realized that Bernie Sanders was gaining steam. So they put unrelenting negative media on him from December um, onward. And it was just completely, it was a completely sad fact that that the media propaganda was so thick. We're going to look at another article that's going to cover just the statistics, one statistical analysis of how um, biased it was. But yes, $72 million in a week of completely positive coverage between South Carolina and Super Tuesday. That is manufacturing consent at its finest. These people were telling Bernie Sanders when he was winning Iowa, when he, he was winning New Hampshire, when he was winning Nevada, they were still questioning his ability to win. They were still attacking him. There was... It was all, it was always, there would be a few positives here and there, but it was majority just vitriolic and spiteful mentioning of Bernie Sanders. It was, it was not in good faith. These weren't good faith, faith actors. And that was the pro, and that was a huge problem. 
Um, standard team zeroed in on the liberal network. MSNBC early on in the campaign is a particular problem, even more than CNN and or Fox News. His aides felt that pundits were extremely negative and unfair towards Sanders. Over the summer, Sanders was top brass out on the network president, Paul Griffin, and the embassy, embassy described an off-record editorial board meeting, so it ended up not being a very productive meeting. And then, during the campaign's attempts to deal with MSNBC, the network's hosts and pundits blasted Sanders the day he won the Nevada caucus, the type of campaign development that might have resulted in other candidates winning a slew of positive media. Chris Matthews compared Sanders' victory in the caucus to Nazi invasion of France. James Carville said Sanders' nomination would be political suicide and that Russian President Vladimir Putin was the happiest person right now about the news. That is absolutely despicable. The fact that they have these people on here spouting utter nonsense and anti-Semitism as Bernie Sanders being a Jewish man to compare his rise to to somebody whose parents or whose family members died in the Holocaust, not his parents, but family members had died in the Holocaust. The fact that they were over here, like like this is saying, on a time when Bernie Sanders, any other candidacy, would be getting massive positive media boost, would have got that $72 million that Joe Biden got after, after uh, South Carolina. No, these pundits refused to give Bernie Sanders his, his dues because they wanted to stop him, because they had a vendetta, because they had a mission, and that was to stop the person that threatened their power, because the people on these shows are millionaires paid by billionaires. These people are not are, are not relating to the to the working class. These people are nothing more than the than actors on a stage tr- trying to be the arms of the DNC. They don't. They might not even know it. I, I I I find it troubling. I think they do know it, and I think that's up to debate as well as as how much ignorance can they can they have. I don't think it's ready. And I want to show you the clip of just the of of Chris Matthews. Listen to listen to this. Listen to this. Man, and this was just common, commonplace on this network. I'm reading last night about the fall of France in the summer of 1940, and the general Renault calls up Churchill and says, "It's over." And Churchill said, "How can it be? You got the greatest army in Europe. How can it be over?" He said, "It's over." So I had that suppressed feeling. I can't be as wild as Carville, but he is damn smart, and I think he's damn right on this one. I'm reading last night about the fall of France in the sun. He compares it to the fall of France like that. Look look at him out here espousing such absolutely horrific beliefs and just absolute propaganda to try to uh, slip into the mind of the American people that Bernie Sanders is somehow akin to these atrocities. You had Cor- I saw headlines of what can be stopped, either the coronavirus or Bernie Sanders, putting those two things in the headline to try to kind of associate Bernie Sanders with something as negative as the coronavirus. It's just rampant. I want to show you another thing here is the Washington Post. Even print media was after Bernie Sanders. Um, So how Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders both reject the reality of climate change is the headline. The first, the nihilism of President Trump. He either believes or cynically pretends to believe that climate change is not a threat. His administration has gravely aggravated the threat, for example, by recklessly relaxing regulation of the super warming gas methane. The second version is the fantasy extremism of Bernie Sanders. He would prosecute oil exemptions for the destruction they have only caused. He welcomes their hatred and and phase out the carbon neutral power, the nuclear power. The Vermont Independent would ban the fracking of natural gas, which is, if you control the methane emissions, a useful transmission fuel for dirty oil to clean wind and solar. The, so they tried to do a double thinking article, somehow comparing Bernie Sanders um, forward thinking and his I, and his idealism about um, climate change, not even idealism, just realism, his, his taking it as a threat, as a serious threat, as somehow being akin to Donald Trump. And there was consistently attempts within this to compare Bernie Sanders to Donald Trump. And that was the farthest thing from being true besides the fact that they both ran on populist message except for that Bernie Sanders was not a full populist like Donald Trump. So it's just from print media, it's everywhere. And I want to look at another article here in these times. CNN's coverage of Sanders was three times more negative than Biden following their big primary wins. So it says, in the 20 hours, 24 hours following his massive win in Nevada, San- Sanders received 3.26 times the proportion of negative CNN coverage that Biden did following the latter South Carolina win, despite the two wins being by similar margins. Sanders received more coverage after his win than Biden did after his. 416 mentions to Biden's 249, but a larger share of Sanders' mentions were negative and fewer positive than Biden's. The above 3.26 figure was arrived at by comparing negative coverage as a proportion of total coverage for both candidates. Given its middle ground reputation, CNN can be a useful proxy for broader media coverage. Um, it's 
not middle ground. It claims to be middle ground, and that's how it tries to gain its credibility. Credibility, but but that reputation of being a uh, middle ground has been skewed because the Overton window has been shifted so far right that yes, within the Overton window that we're um, currently operating in, that it might be the middle, but it's in the middle of a right wing sphere. So. Um, Continuing on, Sanders won a blowout victory in Nevada, garnering 46.8% of the vote in a multi-candidate field, putting him well ahead of Biden's 20.2% support. In the 24-hour period following his win, starting at midnight, CNN's coverage of Sanders was slightly more negative than positive. He received 32 positive mentions, 33 negative mentions, and 354 neutral mentions from CNN guests or hosts. In these times, tended towards conservatism and only logged a mention as positive or negative. It was clearly either. And this might have actually made... Um, if they would have been a little bit more um, liberal with the way they did these, um, and by liberal I mean more like kind of open to how they were um, doing the criteria, they I'm sure this would have been an even bigger margin of people that were negative towards Sanders. But anyway, in contrast, during the 24 hours following Biden's blowout win in South Carolina, bringing in 48.4% compared to Sanders 19.9, roughly the same result, the former vice president received much more funding coverage from CNN. 19 positive mentions, only 6 negative mentions, and 224 neutral mentions. 12 of the negative mentions Sanders received following his win in Nevada either accused the Vermont senator of being far, too far left or denounced him as a socialist. Such criticisms are repeatedly levied via major media outlets with no evidence despite polling that shows Sanders could beat Trump in a general election as trusted on issues deemed important to the de Democratic base. In, this, in the same 24-hour period, six negative mentions denigrated Sanders' candidacy by tying him to Russia or suggesting that the Russian government person him as a candidate. And just a little side note on that is going forward, we do not need to pay any lip service to this Russian red baiting that the Democratic establishment has created to try to um, kind of get us to look the other way from their mishandling of the 2016 election. The, the Russia conspiracy is overblown, and we are in, an, in a pseudo or, or a quasi- uh, McCarthyite era and it needs to stop and Bernie Sanders ever um, Bernie Sanders ever even like giving credence to the Russian um, situation was uh, not helpful in his ability to rebuff claims about Russia so 14 criticisms fell under the umbrella of nebulous electability knocks one of those arguments was delivered by Biden himself Notably, Sanders was not interviewed by CNN in the aftermath of his Nevada win nor was he invited to comment on Biden's win in South Carolina and on Newsroom's 3 p.m. episode later that day, CNN political correspondent Hillary Rosen said, but I also think that Vice President Biden has got a little more inspirational, needs to get a little bit more inspirational. I think telling people they shouldn't have dreams is not going to be a good long-term message. Cutting down someone else's dreams is not a good long-term message. For the purpose of counting negative mentions, in these times did not make qualitative dis distinctions. But it's worth noting Linda Chavez saying, Sanders' win plays into Putin Putin's hands is far worse than Rosen insisting Biden could afford to be a bit more inspirational on a qualitative basis. And this is something that really needs to be looked at. It, these things need to be parsed in peer reviewed things. There needs to be qualitative analysis. There needs to be a really thorough looking at the media bias that went on in this election. And I think if you really look at the media bias that is occurring in this, um, that occurred during this primary cycle and just occurring in America in general, um, from, you could start it just beginning with the 2016 election. It's, unbelievable on both sides and that's why trump was able to say fake news is because the people do not trust the media because the media is rightfully known as liars so when you keep crying wolf all this time trump gets away with claiming things like fake fake news because you people are um stacking the deck so much and people are beginning to realize it Citing a survey from critical mention a real-time media monitoring platform of advertising consultant kevin kate note on twitter that between south carolina uh, closing Saturday and 7 p.m. Eastern on Super Tuesday, Joe Biden earned 71.9 million worth of almost entirely positive national media. Add this is this is uh, corroborating what was in the other story. Add local media in those markets, and it easily tops 100 million worth of earned media in 72 hours. Media monitors and journalism have another type of name for earned media. It's called puffery, and his, and its existence is not evidence of skill on the part of Biden campaign, but rather systemic failure on the part of the media outlets that should be uh, that should not be anointing a presidential front runner as inevitable. And that comes back to what I was saying is that these media narratives were built up to try to prop up Joe Biden against Donald Trump and to hurt and to hurt Bernie Sanders because they feared Bernie Sanders because he was an existential threat to their power. Um, and they just wanted 
Biden or some Democratic establishment person to be the nominee. And by default, Biden was that nominee because he was able to uh, garner the black vote. So I think that um, all in all, it's it's really sad um, at what happened here because Bernie Sanders had... Bernie Sanders had a very good chance of winning uh, of winning this primary and it really it really feels like we were let down because Bernie Sanders did not attack Biden thoroughly did not make the messaging clear between Hillary Clinton and Biden I think was a big thing that there needed to be a clear link between Hillary Clinton and Biden there needed to be a clear link between the establishment and these other previous establishment candidates losing and this was never and this was never taken up appropriately. There was never a, a real concerted effort. It was as though he didn't want to win. Because even now, if Bernie Sanders would have stayed in the race, because this is after Bernie's dropped out, um, he had the potential to win. And I, so I think that really hurt him. I think his lack of, um, or I think his, I mean, he, he did he did TV ads, but I think he could have done even more TV ads to try to um, cater to older voters and to older black voters. Um him not being able to go to South Carolina because of the impeachment um, hearings also were not um, completely beneficial to Bernie Sanders, but I'm not going to give that as much credence as this. And I think the biggest thing that was the um, that hurt Bernie Sanders was the media bias. I think we really need to have a, a real truth telling with each other, sit down, and understand it, how much propaganda is being perpetrated by the mainstream media. And I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican or whatever. You need to understand that. All of these major news um, corporations have a corporate bent to them, and this is obvious. And Bernie Sanders coming into this primary should have should have known this. I think he did know this, but he wasn't willing to do what needed because of ideology of not wanting to injure people and all of this. And I think that kind of that kind of comes down to it too is this not wanting to injure it. And I think that Ber- I think that I think this is something that I've kind of haven't talked on a lot. But if you've made it this far into the video, I think something that is also really important is the fact that. Bernie Sanders didn't want to injure the Democrats because he truly thought of uh, Donald Trump as being some great, terrible boogeyman. But when it really came down to it, uh, Donald Trump was nothing more than another uh, another Republican, but with a little bit more braggadocious attitude. And when it came down to it, uh, Donald Trump was D- Donald Trump was closer was might even is is on par with as bad as George Bush. You'll see people like Ellen and these other uh, quote unquote liberal people going out and hanging out with George Bush and kind of like um, like healing the image of uh, George Bush and the atrocities that he's had, how he handled Katrina, so on and so forth. And I think that Bernie Sanders really got caught into that notion that, um, I think he got caught into the notion that he hurt Hillary Clinton's campaign somehow. And I think he got caught into the notion that he didn't want to injure the Democratic candidates. So, but the thing is though, if you're going to have rhetoric, if you're going to have rhetoric that is um, so bold, you need to stand by it. If you really believe that these people are corrupt, you need to be able to sit down and call Joe Biden corrupt when he's when this Burisma incident happens, when he's taking money from credit card imp- uh, companies and then doing a bankruptcy bill, when he's doing this and he's doing that, voting for the Iraq war, you need to take him on savagely and you do not need to couch any statement by saying that he's your friend. So, because why would you truly, he might be a cordial person and fair enough and you work with him in the Senate, but why would you, why why would you say that you're friends with somebody who is um, hurting the working class? Because he is no friend of the working class. He's no friend of black people, as Nina Turner said. So I really think that the fear of Trump, and that that is one of great Trump's greatest um, attributes, is that he makes people act irrationally. Because when Donald Trump uh, enters the scene, people just act as if though nothing like this will ever happen before i think bernie sanders had the potential to change the dynamic to change to have like a cultural shift to have a norm shift an overton window shift when um he got into president and was able to lead and he would be able to prove that the policies that the democratic party has been telling us were not possible this entire time has been lies and these lies have been perpetrated only to uphold the power of the democratic um establishment so so guys i'm gonna leave you with a video of um I want to play this video actually, and then I might have a couple more words about it. And it's a video of uh, it's a campaign video that Bernie Sanders had with Killer Mike, and I think it really kind of irks me even more watching it because it's such a good video. But Sanders doesn't live up to what this video says. 
favorite writers growing up was a man named James Baldwin. And I remember Baldwin saying, you asked my father to wait, my brother to wait, my uncle to wait. How long must I wait on freedom? How long must I wait on rights and equality and liberty? And as a black child, that resonated with me because I knew I had been denied, my father had been denied, my grandfather had been denied, and I personalized that. But as I grew, I started to understand more white people have been denied, women have been denied, gays and lesbians, transgender people been denied, immigrant children been denied. Everybody outside of that 1% has been denied. So I want you to take a few seconds to like they do in the black church, look to your left and look to your right. Say the time is now. Look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, the time is now. There are more of us, there are more of us, we're stronger, we will wait no longer, we will not wait four more years, we will not wait three more presidents, this is the president, the next president of the United States of America, the time is now. And I think what that video is so good, but I think what is so painful watching that now that it's over was that well, the whole thing of the time is now. The time is now because this is cultural shift needs to happen. Be the time is now because no more people can be sacrificed for neoliberal policies that are advocated for the likes of the establishment and people like Joe Biden. So I really think it's sad that Bernie Sanders would have this rhetoric in videos, would have this re rhetoric at campaign rallies, would, would have subtle rhetoric on um, the debate stage, but he wasn't willing to f to fight that fight. He wasn't willing to act revolutionary. He wasn't willing to stay in and say, you know what, I'm not injuring the establishment. In fact, I'm the only one that can beat the establishment because that, I think, or that can beat Donald Trump. I'm not injuring our chances of beating Donald Trump. In in fact, Bernie Sanders needs to get his confidence up. That's what, And I think that needs to be said going forward for all the races. We need to act like we're the only ones that are honestly pushing for good policies that are going to end up impacting um, other people positively. And I think it, it, it really hurts me, and it really feels me with a, leaving me with a bad taste in my mouth that Bernie Sanders had the, had the audacity to drop out before we got all the way to the convention. And I don't care if he thinks he would have hurt Joe Biden. Joe, if Joe Biden is, is so easily hurt by having another person in the race that isn't even attacking him, I mean, if Bernie Sanders wanted to win, he would have attacked him because, I mean, honestly, staying in the race and not attacking him wouldn't have been that positive. But Bernie Sanders could have at least stayed in the race to try to gather more delegates than he would get outside of it. And he honestly, he if he wanted to win the race, he could have just ramped up the heat on Joe Biden and brought in the sexual assault allegation that is now finally being talked about on mainstream media, brought up his lying about civil rights, brought up this, this, and that, the other bankruptcy bill, everything about it, Burisma, everything, and just went scorched earth. But Bernie Sanders did not have the ability to do that. And while I love Bernie Sanders for shifting the Overton window to what we need it to be, it is really, really unsatisfying with the way this ended. But I think we can learn a lot from this campaign. I think it's given us a good springboard. And I think there's much hope going forward. So this has been the autopsy of one Bernie Sanders on The Questionable Perspective with your host, Killian Carter. Thank you guys for watching, and I will see you guys next time.